All right, I want to begin with a conversation that actually took place 35 to 40 years before Peter penned this letter. It's in Matthew 16, and in verses 21 to 23, it says this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter's been on a journey from self-focus to self-denial. And perhaps we need to go on a journey like that. Now Peter says, Look, beloved, beginning verse 11, as God's people, a new nation of priests from every tribe and tongue, see the passage from last week, be like him. And Peter isn't just saying beloved because he really likes them. He's saying beloved because they are part of the family. They're part of God's family. And they're together, they're one in Christ. Beloved. Children of God. Later in verse 21, Peter says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And really that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through these Passage, this passage this morning, these verses, and we're going to work out what is it that Peter is calling us to do as we follow in the steps of Jesus. From verses 11 to 20, Peter gives us three ways to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Then from verses 22 to 25, he actually gives us a picture of those steps Jesus took and that we are to follow in. So as we look at each way we are called to follow Jesus here from verses 11 through 20, we're going to show how it is that Jesus has already done them, verses 22 through 25. So first, our call as saints who lead the way. Saints who lead the way, that's verses 11 through 12. We are called to abstain from sin. That's the do nots of Christian living. We are to deny something of ourselves as we follow Jesus. But then he goes on to talk about the do's the, of Christian living, the, the things that we are to do to maintain what it means to be a saint, to be one of God's children. And it's so that we may glorify God on his return, and that would be the desire of Christian living. So we've got the do's, the don'ts, and the desires of Christian living. The don'ts. Abstain from desire. And what Peter really means here is abstain from those kind of unrestrained and impulsive feelings that you have to act. That do not act on those. Across Asia Minor, believers gathered to listen to this letter. Often mistreated people. They lived in a world of promiscuity. I'm sure they were tempted by all manners of impulsive escapism. Of what Christ commands us to do and don't do in a world of self-expressionism, isn't it? Self-expressionism says that if you want to be true to yourself, just do what bubbles out of here. But God gives us very plain instructions on how to live our lives. And they often don't correlate with what's bubbling from within, impulsive desires. To one degree or another, we're all going to suffer from impulsivity. We might feel justified at times to act on those. But Peter says, these desires actually wage war against your soul. 
So what about things like sexual impulse? When you're scrolling social media late at night on your own, you indulge that thought about your new colleague. You're enjoying the attention of another person a little bit too much. Several studies show this correlation between porn addiction with severe anxiety, depression, and stress. Others have shown that porn addiction increases the likelihood of low sex drive, a negative impact on your body image, and it increases the feelings of isolation and loneliness. This is not good for you. Let's just be plain. If we act on impulse, we'll be taken in the opposite direction of what is good. In fact, it will wage war against your soul. The evidence is that married, monogamous, heterosexual Christian couples are happier and more sexually satisfied than MDLs. The National Health and Social Life Survey in the United States found that almost 95% of people who worship weekly together feel wanted and needed during intercourse. Brad Wilcox, professor of sociology and director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia, found that 73% of wives who hold gender values and attend religious services regularly with their husbands have high quality marriages. Giving in to sexual impulses outside of godly, monogamous, heterosexual marriage is bad for you. That's sexual impulse. What about anger? When someone makes a jive at you, your kid keeps doing that same thing over and over again. Someone uses you at work to get a leg up. Someone spreads gossip about, about you. Our impulse is often to react, to respond, to get even. The Apostle Paul said, in your anger, do not sin. Righteous anger does have a place, but impulsive, out-of-control reactions, even to injustice, serve no one. In fact, it wages a war against your own soul. To pull you down and embroil you in the injustices as well. That's what anger will do for you. It pulls you into the cycle. Based on Jesus' words in Matthew 26, Martin Luther King said this, Hate begets hate. Violence begets violence. Toughness begets a greater toughness. We must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending, spiraling, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. It, instead of diminishing evil, multiplies it. I wish I could say it like he did. A fascinating study was done on nonviolent and violent campaigns for the overthrow of a government or territorial liberation. And they took data from 1900 to 2006, included every known case with at least a thousand participants. Here's what it found. Non-violent responses were twice as likely to succeed than violent ones. Responding to hatred and violence in kind is not effective. The same is true on a micro level, isn't it? Children of parents in regular conflict are more likely to have behavioural problems and mental health issues especially when the man uses his deep voice or his physical strength to, as a weapon. Children's educational attainment and life opportunities dramatically reduce. They have increased levels of risk of suicide, cancer, heart disease, 
and substance abuse. Self-control leads to overcoming anger and finding peace. Indulging angry impulses leads to subjugation to anger and conflict. Which would you prefer? What about digital impulses? We have this insatiable desire for our phone. I was on a train with Lewis uh, when we went down to London this week and we were going to meet up with other leaders from around the advance movement and I looked up and we were the only people, bar one, on this packed train who were not looking at their phones. Totally packed. The one person who wasn't, I think, was listening to something on their earphones. We're addicted. We have this horrible impulse to pick up our phone at every given opportunity. How many of you even go to the toilet without taking your phones with you? We have a dependence on phones. But is it helping you live a good life? Statistics tell us with great irony that social media actually means that if we are on it, if we're, the more immersed we are in social media, the more isolated, lonely, and depressed we will be. One study by Jean Twenge said that the more teens are on social media, the more likely they are to suffer depression, anxiety, and other disorders. While teens spending in-person time with groups and young people playing sports, in choirs, bands, religious communities, etc., are far more likely to have better mental health. To allow our phones to dick to us is slavery to the empty life that the world offers. Is that what you want? Do you want to be ruled by this thing at the end of your arm? Or would you rather be ruled by Jesus and led into the good life? Indulging sinful impulses in all these ways and in many more, I've just mentioned a few, leads to a hollow, superficial life. Richard Foster in his book, Spiritual Discipline, said this, the doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. The classical disciplines of the spiritual life call us to move beyond surface living into the depths they invite us to explore the inner caverns of the spiritual realm. That's the don't. Then Peter says, do. Do maintain good lives among your neighbours. Love your enemies. That's where true victory is to be found. Love the people around you. Love your neighbour. But, but why does it matter? That's what I want to know. How does it why does it matter how I live? Doesn't it only affect me? And if it only affects me, what's the problem? Well, we've already seen that the Father in heaven is watching. Saw that in chapter 1. And he's watching out of love and because he wants your reverence. Because he is to be feared. But he is actually not the only one watching. And Peter wants us to see that he's not the only one watching. It's so that, end of verse 12, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. So saints following in his steps have to live cross-shaped lives. And as they do, they will see something of Jesus and hopefully put their faith in him. And when he returns, they'll get wrapped up into his glory and his presence and live with him forever. That is the goal, or one of the goals, of Christian living. Show them who Jesus is. Look at verse 22. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
by living as saints, as becoming more like Christ, we get to display something of him to the world around us in the hope that when he returns, they too will be counted among those who are saved. Show them who he is. The denial of these desires are part of our witness to Golgotha. Jesus is the one that Peter quotes in chapter 53 of Isaiah, from chapter 53 of Isaiah. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And even when they hurled insults at him and he, ins- he suffered injustice and scourging and mocking and he was pierced with this crown on his head and the blood flowed down and kneel- nails pierced into his hands and his feet, even then he did not respond with threats. Still self-controlled to do the will of God. Not just to put like a little cross on our Insta bio or a little cute verse pulled out of context. We are to display not a filtered and curated life, but an actual life, an embody, embodied life of Christ to people around us. As you rub shoulders, let them see your rejection of bitterness for forgiveness. Let them see your rejection of hate for love. Let them see the inconsistency for faithfulness. Let them see that you are rejecting gossip for honor. You're rejecting sexual promiscuity for purity. You're rejecting anger for peace. Let them see it. Live it out. The good life is a godly life, one that is self-forgetful, not focused. It's not self-focused. One that says to the world around us, get ready! Jesus is coming! And you're going to have to answer to him too! Get ready! He's going to return in all of his glory and I'm going to live my life in such a way that it displays his glory in some small way as I seek to be more like Christ. Saints, lead the way. And servants, silence your critics. Serve human authority, says Peter. Hmm. How do we feel about that one? The original word translated human authority here is actually created authority. A nod to who is really in control who really is to be served. By serving, we are always ultimately serving. So we serve the authorities that God has given us, and sometimes, even though we are to serve them to his glory, they will not do as they are called to do. They may not lead with justice. They may not lead in goodness. They may not lead us to Christ. Even so, we are called to submit to them. As servants with human authority under God. And we must never forget that we only serve them because God has placed them there. Because we ultimately serve Him. God calls these authorities in His sovereignty. And even when they are unjust, missing their call... We're called to honour, respect, and obey. So whether that's our current Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, or Boris, or Liz, or your local MP, or MSP, or councillor, your boss, your head teacher, whoever it is, honour, respect, obey. But... There is clearly a time to disobey. And there is clearly a time to stand up and say the right thing. Acts 4. Peter, the guy who writes this letter, and John are preaching boldly. And they're pulled in by the ruling Jews. 
and told to stop speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus. But here's what Peter says. Verse 19, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? Rhetorical question. You be the judges. Then they get right back at it, telling people about Jesus. They disobey because the ultimate authority is saying something different to this authority. Same thing happens in Acts 16, Paul and Silas. And the authorities imprisoned them because they were disturbing our city, advocating customs not lawful for Romans to accept or practice. They were doing so in the name of the gospel, and they kept doing so. It actually follows a biblical pattern all the way through. Think of God's people in exile. Later, Rome, in this book, is compared to Babylon. It's kind of the archetype of godlessness in the world, right? Yet in Babylon, Jeremiah 29, 7, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yet, so obey the governing authorities, right? Do good for those around you. Yet, Daniel is heroic for disobeying a new law to pray only to the king. Instead of kneeling before God in prayer, uh, before, the, before the king in prayer, he kneels before God in prayer, and he does so in full view with the window open. I'm going to do it right here in the window, knowing the consequences, and he gets thrown into the lion's den. There is a time to disobey. It's not even true to say that we lay down when it's a personal injustice and stand up to the injustices against others. There are plenty of personal injustices we should stand against. If you're in an abusive relationship, for instance, submit first to Christ. Get out of there. Speak to people that you can trust. It's not godly or God-honoring to stay. You need God's people to help you and guide you and pray with you. And you may also need governing authorities put there for your good. So when do we obey? Even when we don't like it. And when do we not? It seems that Jesus and the apostles were actually interested in answering just one question with this. Does it, lead to pe- does it lead people to God and his glory? That's the ultimate question in all of this. The goal was always to point the unjust to Christ and to give them the opportunity to know God and be transformed to the likeness of Christ. So, we want the wisdom of Christ. We need to call on him and get into the scriptures and learn in each situation what it is that we should do. If I gave you a set of rules, it wouldn't work because the situations change. And in certain circumstances, you will need to submit. And in certain circumstances, you're going to have to stand up and speak against them. When the wisdom of Christ says it's time to turn over temple tables and civil disobedience and to not allow the rules to keep us from loving the unclean, the downtrodden and the outcast, we must speak up. But more often it's what Peter describes of Jesus in verse 23 that leads people to Jesus. To lay ourselves down like he laid himself down in silent submission. Pilate was right about Jesus. There was no fault to be found in him. In innocence, he absorbed insults and beatings. And despite it all, there was no outburst of anger. Hey, just wait until I return. I'll get you. No. That's not Jesus. It's not what he did. He didn't retaliate. He silently entrusted himself to God. 
to the one who judges justly and displays to his enemies even as they kill him something of the glory of God in weakness. After Jesus' part death, no parties or songs or celebrations are reported. The seeming victory over this voice of dissension that he was, this one who was bringing division among Israel's people. No darkness fell, the earth trembled and hushed tones were spoken by Roman soldiers to one another to say, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, majestic in holiness and splendor, sovereign maker of all things, who reigns forever and ever, became sin for us. The blood of the unblemished Lamb of God spilled out for all to see. What power and weakness, what glory and shame. He is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, the passage that Peter quotes in verse 22. Here's what else verse uh, chapter 53 says. It says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. Following his way as suffering servants can only begin to make sense when we have received the wonders and glories of what Jesus achieved for us on the cross. Otherwise, we're just trying to find our own wisdom in amongst the messages of the world. Let's go back to the beginning of 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 1, and then 2, 4. You're elect exiles, like Christ chosen by God from before the beginning of the world. 1, 3, and 23. You're born again, like Christ raised from the dead is our living hope. We are one in him. 1, 4. Co-heirs, like Christ, we share in the firstborn son's inheritance that never spoils or fades. One five, we are shielded by God until Jesus returns. Like Christ, we will share in his final and complete victory. One six, our various trials result in praise, glory, and honor at his return. <laughs> like Christ, suffering is worth something eternal. One nine, we're filled with inexpressible joy of what's to come. Like Christ, God's promises are enough. Two, three, you have tasted the goodness of God. Like Christ, you realize nothing compares to his goodness. Two, five, and nine, spiritual priesthood and a holy nation. Like Christ, access to God as one people. Two, nine, you were in darkness, now you're in light. Like Christ, who went to the darkness of the tomb for you, has risen, and you have risen with him into eternal light. Our lives have to follow his path. One where his, he trusted his father as just and true in every situation. Only then can you find peace in the most horrific of injustices. Only then can you trust that Jesus has already won and will return to take you home. Only then can you find the strength to lay yourself down like him for the sake of those around you. We need the wisdom of Jesus to know how to respond to each injustice, but the answers are there for us in the gospel to help us to see when to stand up and to turn over tables and when to lay ourselves down in submission. I'm sorry that I'm not giving you a a rule book, a play-by-play guide, but it is not possible. You just got to keep looking to Jesus, keep getting deeper into the gospel, keep getting more and more intimate with him and let yourself be guided by him in life and wisdom will grow. Our submission 
or acts of servitude will not save people. Let's be clear about that. But the strength displayed in the weakness of our silence, or sometimes in the standing up against oppression, can lead people to Christ. Catholic theologian Thomas Soding says this, It is only from the center of the gospel that it is possible to recognize where it is worthwhile to fight and to suffer and where false forms are set up. It is only by concentrating on their kyrios, Lord, that Christians can react to the controversies into which they are being dragged in such a manner that he, that the, sorry, the will of God becomes clearer for them and for their opponents. Saints lead the way. Servants silence their critics. And finally, slaves be satisfied. In verse 18, Peter gets pretty specific here about who he's addressing. Now he's addressing particularly slaves. What? Is he condoning slavery? Where's the, where's the, the statement of condemnation? Where, where, why is he not talking about the injustice, the inhumanity of it? What, where's the plan for freedom? What do you mean submit, even if they're harshly treated? How can that be? Especially when we know from history that slaves were commonly harshly treated in the Greco-Roman world. It might be very different to the horrors of West African slave, the slave trade, West African slave trade, or human trafficking today. But it's still completely wrong, isn't it? Addressing slaves here is actually something really beautiful. And we could easily miss it. Peter directly addresses slaves in a world where they are not directly addressed. I can imagine an intake of breath when it's read, or read aloud in these different congregations. The shock of the gospel in the air. In a similar way to the words Paul penned to the Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Peter doesn't address slaves in a separate letter or through their masters. He addresses them as one with the people of God. All we said a moment ago about adoption and being born again and being co-heirs and one holy nation and a priesthood, it all applies to the slaves. In the kingdom of God, you are all equal, one equally dignified, image-bearing, saved, elect people in Christ. Peter is reminding them they're not second-class citizens in the church. They might be in the world, but in the kingdom of God, which Jesus is ushering in and will make complete on his return, is yours, he says. Here's how Jesus himself declared this kingdom in Luke. The first days of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. These slaves are certainly in that category. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that if it's possible for a slave to be fear, at free, they should take it. 1 Corinthians 7, 21. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. Slavery is not part of the kingdom of God. Jesus has come to set the enslaved free. Be under no illusions. Those who have used the Bible to defend slavery haven't been reading these passages correctly because they were blinded by their own cultural norms and biases. The Bible does not condone it, and in the gospel, in this new kingdom, there is no room for it. Instead, Jesus brings freedom and dignity for all, both now in part and in full in the future. 
The specific call to slaves in verse 18 makes no sense without the lead-in that we've already had, right? To all that Peter gives from verse 13. Starts, be subject, right? Then in verse 16, he says, live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. How is it that these slaves will find freedom in part now? Well, they will find freedom in part now, and it is the best freedom of all, by having a change of master. It is to be in reverent fear of God, not their earthly masters, that they are to submit as slaves. Peter is addressing slaves who are powerless to do anything about the injustice of their slavery except to live like Christ in the face of it. And so now he gets practical in a way that perhaps we would miss in our indignation and 21st century sensibilities. He helps them to work out how they find freedom as they live under it and in the hope of total emancipation in this life and certainly in the next. Because they're enslaved to Christ, this new master who is benevolent, who is entirely good, the one who is the the source of all goodness and who can sympathize with them like no other, he, verse 23, entrusted himself to God who judges justly, masters and all. He he entrusted himself to God through the Roman authorities, through the religious elites. If anyone understands this, it's Jesus, the one who was flogged and beaten and pinned to a cross. If anyone can sympathize, it's him. In verse 24, he bore the shackles of our sins so we might die to sin and be born again to a new life of righteousness in him. He is our shepherd, the shepherd of these slaves. He is our overseer in the mess of life, in our slavery, in the injustice of this world. We are free in Christ. He is our liberator, liberator from sin, Satan, death, and the injustice of the world. 19th century Anglican priest, Edward Selwyn, put it this way. Christian freedom rests not on escape from service, but on a change of master. I can imagine Jenny maybe going out one evening and coming across someone who she suddenly realizes being trafficked. She realizes they're being watched. And the system means that's going on in the background means that trying to get this woman out of her situation immediately may actually make things worse. Now there are all sorts of do's and don'ts in these situations. As you learn the wisdom of Christ, And um, I'm not pretending I know them all. But I imagine Jenny might look to take the opportunity here to look straight into the eyes of that woman with the compassion of Christ. And say something along the lines of, God loves you. He sees you. And he desires your freedom. And I hope we can meet again. I hope that we can have another conversation. I would love for you to be free from this life that you're in. But right now, here's the hope I can give you. That there is a much, much better master 
There is a master, there is someone who we will find total joy in if we follow his ways. And he can be your master even now. And you know, one day he's going to return and he's going to bring about justice in such a way that you will be completely free forever and ever. In the meantime, me and some other people, we're going to be fighting for your justice and for your freedom right now. I hope I see you again. I'm going to be praying for you. You are precious in the sight of God. You have been made in his image and he sees you. Even in all this, you are loved. John Calvin said, the Christian life is a free servitude and a serving freedom. We are called to freedom now with the understanding that we won't be totally free until Christ returns. There may be things in your life right now that are probably not as serious as that, but you feel enslaved too. Maybe it's some kind of relationship. Maybe it's some kind of work situation. I don't know. But you need to know that you can have the wisdom of Christ to do what he's calling you to do and find freedom even there. And one day he will return and take you home. Saints, lead the way. Servants, silence your critics. Slaves, be satisfied. Satisfaction in all its fullness is on its way.